Well, quite the week in politics. Tom Mulcair getting standing ovations at the Economic Club of Canada. Justin Trudeau dropping dozens of policy statements. And Stephen Harper in a fighting mood, but still not moving the numbers in the Conservatives' favour. Andrew is in Toronto tonight, Chantel in Montreal, and the Huffington Post Ottawa Bureau Chief Althea Raj in the nation's capital. Uh, of those three things, what did you find the most interesting about the week, Andrew? Oh, for me, substantively, clearly the, uh, the Liberal uh, uh, Democrat reform package. Uh, I just parenthetically like to see the guest list on the economic club thing before I get too excited about the, uh, the standing ovations. But uh, you can say that the Liberals, this was a sort of a Hail Mary pass, that they've been sinking fast in the polls. Probably, they, maybe they might have come up with this policy at some point, but I doubt they would have brought it forward at this point. I think it has had a, quite a good success in terms of altering some of the conversation, getting it off of, oh, the sinking liberals uh, type of conversation, more onto what would they do in power. And I know it's fashionable to say, oh, nobody cares about these kinds of uh, technical changes to how we're governed. And maybe that's true in a, a nitty-gritty sense, but I think in an overall sense of conveying you know, what you're about, uh, what kind of leader you would be, what kind of governing style you would have, I think it uh, arguably will have some success in that regard. Chantal? Uh, I'll pick Thomas Malker at the Economic Club in Toronto. I'm not going to be uh, cynical about who was in the audience uh, because I don't think it would have gotten uh, the same kind of attention even two months ago. And I think that is a clear sign that uh, people are really giving a second look to the NDP and looking at Thomas Malker differently. That may be good or it may be bad uh, for Mr. Malker because the scrutiny now is going to become more intense. Uh, but I also thought that uh, if I'd been the Liberals, I would not have done the Democratic reform package on the same day as Thomas Mulcair was talking about the economy. I thought the contrast between an issue that is probably of more interest and more prime ministerial to most voters and an interesting package was not in the Liberals' favor. I'll see you. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Andrew's selection as most interesting, which is the uh, Justin Trudeau announcement. What struck me about it was the slogan that they had um, on the podium. It said, ready for change. And the next day, something you didn't mention, but the NDP had a rally in Ottawa, and their slogan was, um, ready for change. Uh, so real change, ready for change. And uh, I, I think the whole idea of who best embodies change is really interesting. And they're both fighting for that 60% of Canadians who say they're ready for something new and they're tired of Stephen Harper. But how they go about doing it is really interesting. And I was actually surprised that the NDP didn't go with change you can trust, because it seems like the best thing that they have going for them is uh, is really Mr. Mulcair and sort of the, the dialogue around him about how he's, you know, an experienced politician and it speaks to Mr. Trudeau's inexperience. And I'm not sure that ready for change really does the NDP any favor, but, um, you know, I think things around the slogans uh, struck me. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that whole change idea in a moment, but I want to do something else first. Um, Chantel, uh, talked about, uh, you know, all the attention that uh, Tom Mulcair is getting as a result of a, a variety of different things over the last month or six weeks. Um, he finally got a lot of attention from Stephen Harper this week on a, a couple of fronts. And yesterday was an incredible example in, in, in the House of Commons in question period where they really went at it toe to toe, just the two of them, uh, on uh, some of the major issues I think we're going to see play out in the campaign in terms of how they criticize each other. And I want to show a snapshot, a little more than a snapshot actually, of how that unfolded. These are the highlights of what was about a 13 minute exchange. This is boiled down to a couple of minutes. Watch this. Why did the Prime Minister claim that he had never given Wright any instructions regarding the Duffy scandal? Good to go seems like a pretty clear instruction. I knew nothing of this particular matter. Unlike him who signed all of the papers that took the money inappropriately and fraudulently out of the House of Commons, for which he will have to answer. If the Prime Minister is called to testify in the Mike Duffy trial, will he appear or will he hide? I would invite him to have the RCMP look at his files on the $400,000 he personally took the $3 million of his party took out of the House of Commons. The Prime Minister's team has been convicted of cheating in every single election he has won. What safeguards has he put in place to try to ensure that his team doesn't cheat this time around? $2.7 million taken out of the House of Commons by the NDP, not for any parliamentary purpose, for the use of its own 
party offices across the country. This is exactly the kind of thing that happened in the sponsorship scandal. The Prime Minister is using Bill C-51 to attack our rights and freedoms while offering no proof that this law will actually protect Canadians. What do you expect from a leader who thinks Osama bin Laden is still alive and there's no such thing as a terrorist attack in Canada? 400,000 good-paying manufacturing jobs have been lost while this Prime Minister did absolutely nothing. Shouldn't expect the leader of the NDP to know his facts. Because yesterday, of course, he was out there saying businesses need to pay higher taxes. Will the Prime Minister admit that his plan isn't working, or at the very least, will he please stop visiting assembly lines? Here, here. At least the leader of the Liberal Party knows when to stop getting up. That's the kind of arrogance that could mean that this is the Prime Minister's last question period, so I hope he doesn't mind. We've got a couple more. So I remind the leader of the NDP it will be Canadians, not him, who decides the result of the next election. So Canadians have already decided and they want change. The kind of change Canadians are seeking is change that means more prosperity, lower taxes, greater trade. That's the kind of change they're looking for. They're not looking for the high-tax, protectionist, anti-prosperity agenda of the NDP. All right. If you wanted a... TV debate, you just saw one there, uh, you know, encapsulating how they're both studying each other's, uh, you know, past and agendas and going at it very much uh, toe on toe. Uh, Chantel, what would you make of that? Uh, that it's very hard to be the third player in a game like that and that this is a dynamics. Uh, regardless of who you think won or lost, the Liberals can't like uh, because it, it, they... they for whatever you may say about the arguments on both sides, and I would argue that a lot of this exchange was inside baseball to many Canadians, mm -hmm. uh, you saw two people who fit the frame of the two main contenders. Uh, and uh, in the House of Commons, of course, because Justin Trudeau is the leader of the third party, it, it, it doesn't come across in the same way. But still, I think the dynamics of the next campaign for many people, it was expressed on that floor, and so it helped both Mr. Harper and Mr. Mulcair uh, by si each of them sending the message, it's one or the other. Uh, Andrew? Uh, it, Chantel's right that a lot of the substance of it might be inside baseball, but again, the optics of the Prime Minister and the leader of the NDP going toe-to-toe -to -toe like that will not be lost on people. Remember, it wasn't so long ago that people were saying, oh, Tom Mulcair isn't good in Parliament, but what good is it doing him? He's not getting anywhere, he's not registering, he's way back in the polls. And over time, it does seem to have registered that this is a competent, serious uh, adversary for the government. And those who have been looking to get rid of the government have increasingly been looking at the NDP. It doesn't mean that can't be turned around. But it, it does mean that, that for the governing party, they, the Conservatives certainly have to go after Mulcair now more than they have in the past. Ideally, of course, they'd like to keep the, the Liberals and the NDP in sort of perfect balance with each other. And for that reason, they've had to go soft on the, some of the sort of demonization they might have done in the past because they don't want to come across quite as nasty as they have in the past because that encourages people to search for one party to defeat them. So they've got a kind of a balancing act to go, to go after Mulcair, to go after the NDP without being quite so nasty as they might have been in the past. All right, let me show you what popped up on the Conservative Facebook page just in the last 24 hours. And it's, it's relevant because it's the first time this year that they've done an attack on the NDP. Uh, it's on this issue of whether uh, uh, Mulcair didn't know his facts talking, well, he didn't know his facts, talking about the uh, corporate tax rate uh, the other day. But they had that out on their Facebook page over these last 24 hours. When you go through that page, everything else has always been an uh, attack Trudeau had. So they're shifting in terms of where their target is. Uh, Althea, th that exchange that we just witnessed, uh, what's your take on it? Well, they're shifting, uh, but it not, you know, not in a large swing, if you will. Um, I think that today and yesterday uh, were notable events, and I thought that the Prime Minister looked to be having a lot of fun attacking Mr. Mulcair for still thinking that Osama uh, bin Laden might still be alive. Well, he, he just thought that the Americans may not have killed him. Um, but in any case, he, he looked like he was having fun. And I, I agree. I think that this is kind of a snapshot of what we might see in the debates going forward. Um, I think that the Conservatives did try to sort of prop up the NDP a little bit in the last couple of months, uh, fearing that the NDP was not actually doing that well in areas that are uh, concerning for them, for the for the Tories and the GTA, for example. Um, 
But, you know, uh, when you look at Ontario, for example, the NDP still is in third place. They're first place nationally, but their, their swing is really high in Quebec, and so it kind of offsets the numbers a little bit and perhaps gives them uh, an appearance of having more momentum in certain key battleground ridings that they don't have. I don't think we're yet going to see a conservative attack ad against Mulcair uh, airing wall to wall uh, on uh, TV networks, as we're still seeing at the moment with Mr. Trudeau. But once we see that, I think we'll realize that the PMO is uh, now more concerned about the NDP than the Liberals, and that is not the case at the moment. There's still far more concern about the Liberals. On that? Can I just add that the last time that I watched a party give a leg up to the NDP because they thought it was in their interest was the Bloc Québécois <laughs> giving Tom Mulcair a pass in Outremont and in other writings because they thought it would hurt the Liberals. There is a point that you can play this game, but there is a point where it becomes too late to stop someone who has momentum, and it's a very dangerous game to play. Uh, and I believe that if the Conservatives are really looking to win a, a fourth majority, they're going to have to do more than sit uh, back and think that they can just uh, stage manage the opposition division uh, in their favor. Because uh, when people decide that they're no longer voting for the Conservatives, and you see it in the polls, those poll numbers would suggest that some conservative voters are actually shifting to the NDP. Uh, at some point, you have no friends left. You don't have enough to win. Mm -hmm. I want to show you a picture of Justin Trudeau. It's our, uh, our, our photo op of the week uh, for two reasons. One, there he is with, uh, you know, if you, if you want a big photo op with a big signature behind you, there it is, the Peace Tower. But uh, as um, uh, Althea was saying a few moments ago, look at the, what the sign says, real change. Now, all elections, and this next one is four months tomorrow, um, all elections are usually fought on the issue of change. Is change necessary or not? And if it is, who's the agent of real change? Uh, so we've seen both Mulcair and Trudeau in the sort of change uh, battle this week. Um, who's ahead on that front, do you think, Andrew? I think the NDP has been, and I think this week will be interesting from that standpoint of can the Liberals regain some of that mantle. And obviously that slogan is aimed straight at the NDP. It's the slogan you could imagine the NDP running on. They had been, I think, until now saying, look, the Liberals might be a different party than the Conservatives, but it would be the same policy. So their emphasis has been on change of policy. I think, as I said earlier, I think the function of that democratic reform package is to say, well, real change is a change of governing style, a change of we'd be more approachable, we'd be more open. And that's going to be the interesting question is for those voters who are searching around and, and are looking for change, what's the more important version of it? Is it change of policy or is it change of governing style? Chantal? I'm not convinced uh, that this is a huge uh, liberal change, although there are shifts. I mean, uh, the electoral reform changes to my eye, one of the bigger changes. But I re remember that uh, Paul Martin came into office pledging to fix the democratic deficit. Then Michael Ignatieff went one more and tried to make that an issue in his campaign. And he did have quite a bit of material to go with. Uh, and this is kind of the third attempt. There's a lot in it that is really interesting that would change the House of Commons uh, and Parliament. But I'm not convinced that you win an election on packages like that, as interesting as they may be. And on electoral reform, what I found really interesting was that we now have uh, three of the four national parties in the House of Commons, counting the Green Party as one of those, in favor of electoral reform. And that, to me, is kind of a first. All right. You got a quick last word on this, Althea. Listen, on the idea of change, I think that Mr. Trudeau best embodies change, but his party does not. And the NDP as a party uh, is more of an agent of change, except the leader may not be uh, compared to Mr. Trudeau. And so uh, they're both kind of, they're both playing in the same sandbox for sure. All right. Thank you all. Althea joining us this week from Ottawa, Chantel's in Montreal, Andrew here in Toronto.